um, with also one of our students here at Tony Med School, person of color only. Um, so before we dive in into the conversation for today, um, I would like to just restate some of the ground rules, um, especially for those who might be joining us for the first time. Please, um, as you join in, do ensure to mute your mic once you join. And um, for those who still have their device, um, their devices are not named yet. I can still see some unnamed devices. Please ensure to rename your device with your full name. I can see someone with AB and um, some other devices that are yet to be named. So please ensure to rename your device. Um, those who have their phone number as the name of the device as well, please rename your device. And um, also ensure to stay muted um, during the session until you are asked to do so. There'll be a time for questions and uh, questions and answers. So once it's time for that, um, we advise that you drop your questions in the chat box. Uh, if, if you can't do that, you can also just raise your hand. For much more, we would prefer that you drop your questions in the chat box. And once it's time for that, the moderator would also take that up. Uh, so um, I also, I would also like to say that if you are, if your camera is going to be on, if your video is going to be on, please ensure that you are in a good position um, if you want to put your video on. And um, if you know that you can't um, be in a very good um, position, you can just keep your video or your camera off um, during the course of the session. All right, so also we are going to be sharing a survey um, towards the end of the session. Um, we noticed that some persons drop their name during the sessions. So um, please note that we would not um, take your details from the chat box. We would um, rather get your details from the survey that we be sent. So do well to fill the survey. If you need the recording or the slide for this session, for today's session, so we would only share that with those that fills um, the survey. So do well to fill the survey um, once it is launched. Okay, so I think um, I'm not missing anything. I think that's all for my end. So um, once again, I welcome everyone to today's session as I hand over to Bukola to um, bring up the speaker. Bukola. Thank you very much, uh, Maka. Uh, once again, good afternoon, everyone. And you're welcome to Rome Business School Nigeria Business Leadership Development Program. Um, today's topic is aligning HR strategy with organizational goals. I don't know if, if you can hear me. If you can hear me, please drop a chat. You can hear me. Yeah, we can hear um, I guess we can. All right. My name is Bukola Luri. I'm a senior woman resources officer at Brian Moro. And it's my pleasure to moderate today's event, which has bring um, top personality from prestigious institutes and the heart of and the heart to business, Rome Business School. And I'm so excited about today's program, especially. Um, today we have a special guest, Mr. Um, Dr. Onduka Okyoso, um, who will be speaking to us on the topic aligning HR strategy with organizational goals. I'm going to start briefly with Mr. Dr. Onduka's brief bio. Dr. Onduka is a human resources professional with over 16 years of experience in human resources management. He has his first degree in dental surgery from the University of Lagos and a master in management information system from the University of Brooklyn. He's an associate of Chartered Institute of Personnel Management and is also certified in analytics on talent management by the Human Capital Institute. His HR career started as an analyst in human capital at Philip Consulting, where he was involved in recruitment, um, training, business process review, and HR strategy. Dr. Onduka moved on to KPMG in 2007, 
where he was involved in recruitment exercises and learning and organizational development for leading companies in various sectors in Nigeria. In 2011, he joined Elton Network as the head of talent management with the responsibility of designing and implementing employee engagement to achieve corporate goals. In May 2015, Dr. Unduka joined Bot Oil PLC as the head of talent management, where he worked in, in cooperation with key businesses and HR leadership to co-create, to co-create, execute, lead, and evaluate the um, impact of key talent processes for Port Oil and its subsidiary, including but not limited to talent acquisition, performance management, talent development, succession planning, and retention optimization. He later joined Midwestern Oil as oil and gas as the head human resources. His role involved developing and implementing the our company's human resources strategy in line with business requirements. He's currently the MD slash CEO of Soresa Services and HR advisory firm. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Anduka to brief us on the topic. And um, I'm going to also have that if you have any questions while the presentation is going on, you can note it down and drop it on the chat and uh, we'll make sure to go to your questions. Um, over to you, sir, Dr. Anduka. Okay, good afternoon. Can, can everybody hear me? Nicola, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, sir. Yeah, we can hear you, sir. So thank you. Awesome. So thank you for that introduction. And I welcome everybody to this session on how you align HR to your organizational goals. I always say that um, HR is very key in any organization. Even in these days of age, AI and all that and technology, you still need an HR person to do certain things. It's, it's the iterative process that you can automate, but nothing beats that human feeling, basically. So I'll just share my slide and we'll just talk through it. And um, basically, can, can we see my slide? Can yes, that's it, Yes. Okay. So basically, we'll just talk through, I mean, I said, um, during my session, actually, I, um, if you have any questions, you can just put your hands up, ask the question, or put it in the chat. So if I see it, I'll answer. I like to take questions as I go along. It also helps to also make the clerks more active and all, basically. So um, in terms of overview, can you see the content in terms of overview? Because I can see it. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Awesome. So basically, we're going to be lo looking at um, an overview, then we'll be looking at how you evaluate your human resources. The next thing we'll look at is how you align HR strategy to organizational goals, then foster a strong organizational culture. And how does technology and data analytics help us to achieve those goals we set for the organization? And then we then monitor and evaluate and we then conclude. So this whole thing about HR strategy, goals, something that's always very iterative. A lot of organizations will say, okay, HR, I want you to do this. I want you to climb the highest mountain. I want you to bring the smartest people. But, but they just keep asking, asking, asking us to do sometimes the impossible. So what I always ask myself is first things first, where do we need to start from as HR people? And I think the, first, the starting point we need to first understand is we need to know what direction the organization is going in terms of your mission, your vision, and your values, you know? Vision is the broader perspective, where we want to be, it's a destination for the organization. This is where the organization wants to get to. Then the mission tells us how we're going to achieve that. The one thing I really want to point out here is your values. You know, in terms of values, you know, in this are days now, a lot of values are eroded, are, become, are eroding by the day. So as an HR person, for you to be able to deliver on what the organization wants, you have to ensure that people that you're bringing in have similar values like you are, or that of the organization. That's where you come in as the HR person. It's extremely important. Any other questions on this before I del delve into the next, the next slide? Okay, so as I said, the vision, the mission, and our values are very important for you to be able to, for you to say you want to even come up with any strategy, you want to do anything, 
as a, as an organization. So the first things first, we need to look at first things first is our people within the HR team. So we need to do like a SWOT analysis. That the people I have on my team, can they do what I can they do the work we want them to do so that we can design a, a craft an HR strategy to deliver on the organizational goals? We ask us those questions first. So look at our people capability. Are people capable of doing it? Are people capable of crafting those HR strategies that we require? Or we, and this is the starting point. If we don't have those people, then we need, then there's no point starting. That means we need to start to get people that can help us achieve that HR strategy to meet the organizational goal. And also take a step backwards, I also something I also want to highlight. One key thing I always ask employees is that how does how does the organization make money? You know, for example, if you're in an like let me use the oil and gas sector now. If I ask, okay, how does how do they make money? So people just oh, they just sell oil and then they just pay them. But there's more to it. You know, there's a process, there's a system in place to be able to achieve that for you to be able to sell your oil. There's one thing from the oil to come from the ground, and there's another thing to get it to the place where you're going to sell it to, or where you're going to take the terminal you're going to sell it to. So all that process, an HR person needs to understand that value chain. That's why it's very, very important for the HR person to understand what the business con business is, what the business wants to achieve, the, the goal of the business, and then before you're able to even craft your own strategy to align with that of the business. That's why I'm emphasizing. Look in at your own people capability. Do I have people internally that can achieve this for me as an HR person? If I don't, am I, am I going to have to go and buy someone, get someone outside? Or are my people, can I develop them to be able to achieve this? That's the first thing. So that's where we're going to start first. Then the next thing we're going to start looking at, once we've done that, we have to start looking at, at our recruitment process. That's the talent acquisition process. We need to sort of evaluate it. Is it optimal? Is it getting us the right people that we want? One thing I've, learned, I've noticed, I don't know a lot of HR people on this on this call now. We know that sometimes when you advertise on LinkedIn, you just get all sorts of CVs, and you just get frustrated in what you're getting. So what I always recommend, depending on the role you're trying to source for, you need to just do like target those passive candidates, those people that are not looking for jobs. So what processes are you putting in place in terms of recruitment, talent acquisition to be able to achieve this this bit? It's extremely important to do that. And then look at your employee, your employee development. You know, what's the process of training? Do you, is training a feel good for your organization? Or just say, okay, uh, we have some, someone has given us a brochure on training. Okay, let's send people to training and let's go and do training. Or is it tied to your performance management system where you identify the gaps and then you train these people? Another area you also need to also look touch on, another process is your compensation and reward. This is, this, this, this is a big ticket item here, you know? Compensation and reward. Although some people say money is not everything, but <laughs> I'm sure we heard that joke. There's better to be crying in a Rolls Royce than in, in, in a Volkswagen. But anyway, as I said, you need to get your compensation and reward system optimal also. How do you reward your people? How do you compensate them? Are you a pie within the industry? Are you paying below the industry or paying above the industry? So the onus is on you, HR, to be able to get this information to find out where you're paying, where you're, where you're paying up, where you're paying above. Or below the industry, and how you're also rewarding your um, personal. We'll elaborate that uh, on that more as we go further. Then also your performance management system is it robust enough? Is it objective enough? You know, we're mid we're media now, so a lot of companies will probably having their media appraisal either in June or July. You know, there's what goes start from the beginning of the year till till now, or everybody's just going with the motions. So you need to evaluate your performance management system to be able to understand this bit also. And also engagement and retention, extremely key. There's one thing in bringing people into your business and there's another thing able to engage and retain them. That's extremely crucial. What processes do you have in place to be able to do this? That's the question I'm throwing out. Do you have, a, 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 do you have initiatives that we can put in place for our employees? Or what's our retention strategy? If someone says they're going, just say, okay, bye-bye, be -bye, going. Then start looking for the next person to able to um, bring them in. Any questions so far? Questions, comments? Okay, okay, I'll check out. Okay, let me. Okay, no questions so far. So I'll move on to the next. This, okay, no question yet. Awesome. So, so the next thing we're going to be looking at basically is once we've evaluated our human resources, and put, sometimes we need to tidy our own house first before we start thinking about creating a captain and strategy for the organization. So once we've studied a lot of all these things up, we then go ahead and then start to 
align it to the proper HR, align it to the proper organizational goals. First things first, HR people, you are the gatekeeper of any organization. That means you are the person, you are, you are the gate to ensure that you get the right people into your business. So you now start to look at your talent acquisition strategy. What are those recruitment strategies you can put in place to ensure you are you are hired by people? For example, I was talking to a candidate who is was interviewing for a client, and the client had said, "Okay, let's have this interview on so so and so date." So he got ready, and it was online, and he was waiting thirty minutes, forty minutes, fifty minutes, and they came back and said that, "Oh, the person that's supposed to interview just entered, got into a, a meeting now, so they had to reschedule." That's already a bad taste in the candidate's mouth. Recruitment needs to be taken seriously. So the recruitment manager that needs to be on that interview needs to know how important it is to be present. You know, those, those things are because that point of contact of recruitment with you, it tells a lot about your organization. So it's extremely important for us to look at our talent acquisition strategy. So if you're having an interviews now, everybody should be aware. The CVs should be ready. Candidates should have been contacted. You know, and everything, all the systems should, should be running. If it's, it is physical, yes, make sure everybody is ready, everybody's on time. If it's virtual, just your system to make sure everything is working properly as a business. It's extremely important. That's where HR comes in all that. So the, your time, that's why your recruitment strategy is extremely important for any business. Then even the whole process from the from you having your recruitment requisition form for you. And again, when managers bring um a form that, oh, they want to hire. As an HR person, you need to also ask questions. They ask the why. Why are you, why are you trying to fill this role? What benefit would this role have for the organization? Is this something we can fill now or something we can fill later? You just, you just don't send forms to you and you just sign off, okay, we need one person and then let it go. No, you are supposed to be the gatekeeper to do check and balance. Is there anyone within the business who can get to fill this role? So those are questions you need to ask and also put into your system to be able to be able to achieve this and to be able to support the organization because you, as the HR person, you know what the goals of the organization are and you know where the organization wants to go to. So those questions you need to also check and ask those questions. And then the performance management system has to be robust. Some companies use a ballot card, some companies use some other things they, they know. But also in also setting up your performance management system is extremely key. So you have the proper goal setting at the beginning of the year. Your goals must be clear, you know, and also, the owner also on HR to let employees know that performance management is not a punitive thing. You know, a lot of people say, ah, performance is coming. I'm going to get you on for power because you didn't greet me well today. Your performance is coming. I'm going to score you a D. It shouldn't be like that. You know, that's why, um, that's why HR needs to continue to reiterate and to let employees know that it's a, it's a developmental process. It's part of the chain to ensure that we're getting the right people in the right place. And also, so when you're also setting up a performance management system and also setting goals, don't have too many goals. You know, just have the five things, you know, to me, between, so, between five and seven things you can really do. It's extremely important so you can make, and also make sure that goals are setting are also smart. I'm also an advocate for, because uh, I know HR most time reports to the MD. It's also very good if the MD has a bias for HR. That's when HR also can also support the organization efficiently. Because I've seen cases where the MD is not, Bias towards the child. So any HR initiative is always thrown out and nothing always happens. And also in your metrics for performance for performance management, what are those incentives that are also going to be in place? So what's on that uh, does exceptionally very uh, exceptionally well, what are those things you're also going to do? You know, so you look at your system, align to the goals of that particular organization in terms of your performance metrics, your performance measurement, in terms of also people you want to bring in. For example, I'll use another example. I'll use, I'll use, I'm going to use a lot of examples in the oil and gas industry too, because that's what I'm, fam, I'm a lot of I'm, I'm quite familiar with. For example, if you're going to drill a new well as a goal of the organization, say in the, in the next couple of months, the onus is as you as an HR person to say, okay, that means at this period of time, these engineers are going to be looking for. Where are we going to source those engineers? Can we see how everything is tied together? You know, it's not just you we're going to just recruit from anywhere. Where are we going to get these people? People that have done this kind of work before, where can we find them? So most of the, this kind of is going to be more of head hunting. Then how are we going to manage their performance? The KPIs we are going to set for them. Those are the questions we need to ask. So as, as we are going along, then also in terms of employee development, the training plans. If training plans should be an output of your performance management system, 
what are those gaps you have identified from this employer or from this employee? How can we develop how can we develop this person so this person can meet the organizational need? So there's a skill of thought that this we say always say that your development as an employee is your own hands. The employee is only going to, the organization is going to develop you for thing on things that are beneficial to them, not to you personally. Do you understand? It's extremely important. We need to understand that the organization is going to develop you on the skill set that's going to be valuable to them. You can't just tell the organization, oh, that this is a new system in place, this is a new system. I want, and I want to learn this. But the question is, how does it benefit that organization? So that's where the performance management system is extremely important and needs to be robust enough to be able to identify those skills that we are looking at. Then also have development programs that you can also put in place for your people and also for your future leaders. You know that all those high flyers you have within your organization, how do you manage them? How do you train them? How do you develop them? There's some training courses you can you can go you can send them to an LBS. It can also be part of an incentive for them as your people are also doing well and also performing their work very, very well. The next thing we also talk about is engagement and retention. This is extremely crucial for any business. In these are days of Jack one now, you know, we have to also be very, very careful on our, because right now I tell people that we're in the employees market, not the employers market. You know? I've I've had um, someone that we hired for a particular client of ours, and then we were in the process of hiring him, and um, what they were going to pay this person was much more for where the person was coming from. But the deal breaker was that the person had to come to work every day. Or like where this person is working now, the person only goes to work like twice a week. You know, so that was the Delta deal breaker. So those are little in incentives we can put in place for employees, work from home and all those kinds of work. The, the way of work has totally changed right now. So all those things have to, we have to try to see, how can I get the best out of my employee? You know, there's some jobs that you cannot work from home for, definitely. There's some jobs you cannot work from home for. But the ones that you know that the person can work from home, it's better to be able to allow that. But the thing that you have to have a robust performance management system to be able to manage them, to ensure that actually doing the work that you hire them for. Then also, the initiatives you want to put in place to also um, enhance your employee retention. I don't want to talk about um, money, money, money all the time as, as an incentive or initiative, but what are those things like wellness program you can put in place for them, do, 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 doing um, um, medical checks for them, you send them on projects that they can do, cross-functional projects can also help to be able to achieve this. That's one, those are the things you can also put in place for them. Also, put their aspirations, their goals, or things that they want to do personally, you can also try to also help them in that particular area. Now, in terms of compensation and reward, it's extremely important for us to be able to understand this clearly. Uh, who, who writes it? What, what's the difference between compensation and reward? Is that, is that a difference? Is there a difference between compensation and reward? Who wants to help us out there? You can put it on the chat. What's the difference between compensation and rewards? They are always, always, always together a lot of times. But as it, like, oh yes, there's a difference. So who wants to help us? Anyone wants to help us the difference between compensation and reward? Okay, yes, and Jude, you're saying yes, there is. So what is it? What is it? You don't want to you're saying yes, there is a difference. So can you help us? You can just uh, raise your hands and I will mute you. Yes. Reward is the price you get from, okay, good work. And compensation is part of benefits of the job. I think you are mixing. So reward is the price you get from good work. Compensation is part of the benefits of the job. Reward is what you get after KPI. I think you, you, you mix them up. <laughs> okay, Adol. Okay, okay, is it Victor that wants to help? Victor Patrick. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me? I can hear loud and clear, crystal clear. Okay, so for me, um, when you we say reward, reward is as, for example, in some organizations, they create um, a forum where, like for my organization, let me just use my organization, for example, we have a reward and sanction system that shows that if you are doing well or you are meeting up your deliverables, you have a reward for meeting that. That is to say it's an extra addition for doing your deliverables and doing your deliverables on time. And then for compensation, compensation for us is basically like um um like your wages for 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 the work that you've put in. 
Over. Yes, yes, a well fed actually. So compensation is for the wages that you put in for the pay, the job that you're doing, your KPIs and all those things. Now, reward is that extra thing that we do for you. You know, like compensation is constant. You're coming to the organization, we're paying you 1,000 naira a month. That's what we're going to pay you. You know, if you have a bonus, a bit of bonus, we can also give you that compensation. But reward has to do with other things like maybe recognition program, some bonuses, some maybe some incentive like um, tickets, you know, exactly the same thing, things like tickets you can provide for, for give your staff. Like now we have a lot of Gen Zs in the organizations now. A lot of them are, they like to travel. So things like tickets can be like a reward if they meet a particular performance. The iPhone 16 is coming out in September now. You can say, okay, if you guys deliver on this project, if you do very well, we'll get you guys iPhone, iPhone 16, you know? The Gen Zs will love that and, and the young people in the new organization. So those are what that's what we, we, we want. Yes, the world, no, no, not necessarily monetary. Yes, you're, you're, you're correct. So we can see the difference. So as an organization, we need to find out where do we want to play, you know, in terms of compensation, in terms of our rewards. I remember while, while, when I was in Airtel and um, anytime I wanted to poach someone from an MTN, it was always very, very difficult. Not, not because, um, because what, what happened was that in terms of pay, monthly pay, Etel was paying better. But in terms of reward and benefits, MTN was over the roof. So it was very difficult to push anybody from, from MTN in, in, in those days. So that has, you have to understand what your pay philosophy is. You have to understand affordability as an organization. So even when you do your remuneration survey, Know what organizations are paying within your industry. You know, you either want to pay above or pay below or pay between, but just know where you are. It's best to know where you are than you not knowing where you are at all. So that's where compensation comes in and how you that and then align it to your own organization goals. For example, if an organization want what part of their goal is to bring in people from far and wide, expatriates and everything, and in terms of business, in terms of revenues, are not putting up to it. It's almost natural that look. But that this cannot work because we are not we are not paying as we should and we cannot attract these people, you know. So those are thick questions and things we need to push out. And also in terms of reward, all of those things we can put in place, like reward programs, incentives, performance bonuses, all those also helps. And also things like career development opportunities, work from home is a big one. A lot of people are, are, are really into it. And the work-life balance. The organization is so that you work from 8 to 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. every day. You know, you just be burnt out. Or you have some slack things you give your people to so, say, okay, work. I know, I know an organization, they don't, they don't come to work on Mondays and Fridays. They don't come Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And the reason for that is that the Mondays, most of them are doing meetings. So the question is, why do I have to drive all the way to work to come and attend meetings and not get anything done? So that's everybody just log into your system, your Teams, or your the Teams of uh, or, or, or Zoom. We have all the meetings we have to do for the year on Monday. Then Tuesday, when you come to the office, make sure you are focusing on the work that you are doing. Then on, then on Friday, start putting your reports together that you're going to talk to us about on Monday. So they find out that they're more efficient like that. Rather than know how Monday is, you go to an everybody's doing meeting, I'm doing meeting, I'm doing meeting. By the time you know it's 2.30, 3 o'clock, and you find out that nothing has been achieved for the day, nothing. You know, so sometimes Mondays can be a waste. You know, but that's, that, when they told me, I was like shocked that, yes, that's very strategic. So you're using Mondays for meeting and nobody's allowed to work. Everybody's logging on their computers and getting things done. The next thing you also have to do is have a good succession plan in place. Identify the critical roles within your business and the ones that have key man risk. I say key man risk in terms of there's some roles in your organization that you don't have a, a back to back on. If that person leaves, the organization would, might be in trouble. So as an H, so as an H, as the, as the um, HR person in charge, those are things you need to be looking at. The critical roles, make sure that you have people that can fit into that role, maybe people internally or people ex externally. If you, have, if you have identified people externally, just keep them warm, as they always say. Have conversations with them. They're not bringing them in yet, but just like having conversations, building relationships with them, have, a, have, a, have like a talent pool of that of them. So the day the person on that role says it's going, you can then plug in someone into that business. Then also for critical roles also, and people on that role, Ensure that they have the right skill sets, you know, and competencies to develop on that, to to build, to do on, to be on that road. If they don't, you need to train them, build them up, and also find out what the issues are, you know, to, to put them in those places, and also have a pipeline. It's very, very important for succession.
planning. It's very, very otherwise. But that's why most organizations, they don't have that in place. Some businesses say, I don't need a success, I don't need a succession plan. I'm still very young. No, we all do. Because a, a business is an entity, not an individual. You know, so it's extremely important because I have a client now and they, they have a lot of key man risk. And the reason being that most of the people in those rules, they don't want to bring in anybody so that they feel the person comes in, they might be redundant. But I think that's a very um, myopic way of seeing things, you know, because they're also very lean in that organization. So I said to them, they need to have people because some of them don't even go and leave. They go and leave. There's always someone calling where this, where this, where that. And also for your own mental health also, it's extremely important for you to have people that can also be your successors in those areas. So we just, that's what I was trying to put together. So align your HR search your organization group. We have to look at our processes. How do we ensure our products are effective, are efficient to be able to drive this to meet organizational goals? If you don't have this in place, then we haven't started yet. It's extremely important. So the next thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at the culture within an organization. Culture is extremely, extremely important in any business. That's what defines you as a business and why people want to come and work with you as an organization. So the first, the starting point for me, I just think for things like this is from the HR basically drives culture, but it has to come from the top the leadership team. The managing director, he needs to work the talk. The CEO needs to work the talk to say, okay, this is the kind of culture I work, I want in my organization. And they have to work the talk, not just saying it. So leadership team must embody and demonstrate the values of the organization. You know, but HR needs to ensure that this is done, it needs to drive it in building that culture. And to drive that culture, especially in the recruitment process, we have to sort of evaluate the people that we are bringing into our business. Do they have the right fit? Do they fit into our business? You know, most um, interviews you, you listen to this, they say, tell me about yourself. For me, I feel that's a bit too, it's too, what's that word? Not too very plastic, very flat. Because a guy can prepare a story for you and tell you a beautiful story and like, wow, 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 wow. I think the best way to go about that basically is to be able to look at something on the CV. Like I used to start up a conversation. For example, the person says, I love to swim. You can pick it up and say, oh, I just I say you love to swim. And, and I'll say, oh, oh, for me, I, mean, I hate, I don't like swimming because I, I hate water. So if the person actually loves to swim, you say, oh, no, swimming is beautiful. You can do lapses and they start to talk about it. And then you can build on that. Even things like, oh, I love to travel. Oh, where have you traveled to? And why did you, why did you go to this country? What did you learn from them? Or the state you went to? Oh, I like to read. What book are you reading now? Why did you choose this book? So asking all those questions, I'm trying to see the way this person thinks, how, how their the, the state of mind, how they can how they can be a good fit within your organization before you then start to build into the technical questions. So you can start with the behavioral question, get to know this person. I, ca I call it speed dating. You know, you're asking, Honest question. You're not saying, tell me about yourself. How do you do this? How do you do that? Do you understand that? Building up a, a rapport, building a conversation based on what you've seen on their CV and see how they respond. It helps a lot. Then the values and culture you desire to see. Key thing, your onboarding process is very, very important for any employee. It's extremely important. You need to get that process right. In some organizations, they, they are on a first name basis. We're knowing this our culture and our tradition. You can't call someone much more older than you by your first name. But you can also create a way, for example, if someone's name is Taiwo, and maybe the person is maybe a GM, his name is Taiwo. If I want to call him a Taiwo, you can say Mr. T. You know, things like that you can bring it so that there's um that that there's fluidity in the business, everybody's relaxed, they're not coming to work all tense. So that's one key rule HR needs to foster within any business. I go to some organization and I hear, oh ma, sa. My madam said this, my madam said that. I feel it's very, when you hear those words, I when you go to a store, a shop, you know, and you say, my madam said this, my madam said this, or they say, madam, I name is madam Bukola or madam this, you know. I think it's a bit too, for me, I think it's crass. I think there's a better way we can go about it within the business. Especially that's why the, that onboarding process is very important for any business and any organization. So we need to get it right as, a, as a, a, a HR people in our business, okay? Then also, in terms of company goals, performance, town hall meetings. I don't know how often we do town hall meetings in our business, in our various organizations. But for me, what I know about town hall meetings is a point where employees also evaluate the leadership team. What do I mean? In the town hall meeting, first thing, the way it normally runs is the management team or the MD presents the numbers. That's why there has to be a lot of transparency also 
on the part of the organization, present the numbers. This is how we performed against where we want to be. So that when a player doing the ask, they can also see it clearly. You know, because sometimes the place is oh, the company is making a lot of money, but they forget the overheads that also comes with all that. You know, you can make a billion and your overheads might be 700 million, 800 million and all these other things. So I think that's where transparency comes in doing an organization and doing your town hall meetings. And things that you agree on in the town hall meetings with staff, make sure that you do them. So because the next, in the next town hall meetings, these are going to be the, sub, the, the subjects of discussion. So you bring those things out to speak to them, to say, okay, you guys ask, you ask for a new caterer. As you can see, there's a new caterer in the business now, and this is and this has been done and all that. So that builds that builds trust with you and the organization. It's extremely important. And also have a good feedback mechanism for your employees where they can also give feedback on things they're happy with, things they're not happy with. And also try and create team building sessions where everybody can work together harmoniously. There's a saying that, oh, we don't have to be friends, we can just work together, or we are colleagues. Fine, true, but if you're in a team and you're a manager of a team, I think it's, ex 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 it's very, very important for you and your team to be, get, to be together and to be like friends, understand each other properly. Because I always say that your people are working for you while you are working for the organization. The team is going to make sure that you look good in front of the MD. So we need to learn to build that rapport among our team members. And so he's my colleague, she's my colleague, but we spend about eight hours with them every day. You know, we spend 40 hours with them. Or like your friends outside that you hardly ever see. So now who is the colleague, who is the friend? So the explain is part of us to build those relationships up within our business, uh, our various business, so that we can also thrive and, and deliver what is expected. This is also good for our culture within the organization. And also, intergovernmental projects. This also helps in terms of engagement. You know, you have people working in silos. Oh, I'm in finance, I'm in HR, I'm in sales. Ah, we don't like these HR people. HR people, Jawala is always too, too much. Everybody's covering everything, you know? And I always try to say that when HR is bringing out an initiative, it's extremely important to get everybody, get, get, get a point person in each department to be part of that initiative. So if you don't look at it as a, an HR initiative, you look at you see it as an organizational initiative. So find people in finance, very, very important because they're the ones that are going to bring out the money in sales, in marketing, in production, that can help. So that when I bring up, when I share those ideas, they'll tell you, ah, well, this will work, this will not work. So by the time you finish all this, everybody, whatever initiative you bring out can be accepted. It should not just sit down and say, okay, these are the initiatives we want to do, A, B, C, D, this is what they did in company A, let's also do it in our own company. So it's very important for us to bring down those silos and bring everybody together when we're actually doing um, projects or in terms of employer engagement. Then also a positive work environment is extremely crucial. That's what I think very, very important. And it also reflects your value as an organization. I'm sure we've heard some organizations are extremely toxic. You're going to work morning, your heart is beating. And people are gossiping here and there and all that. So the onus is on HR to be able to manage this, to ensure that the environment is positive, it's open, it's friendly and it's warm. It's very important for us to create that particular environment. I one, one of my MDs I, I worked with in one of my organizations. One thing I liked him for is that the employee came to gossip to him about something about somebody. We said, okay, just hold on. We'll call that person and say, okay, repeat what you just told me so that everybody is clear on one page. So it's not like he said, she said, you know, so everybody is on one page together. And at the end of the day, you need to do a culture audit measure our culture to ensure that, okay, yes, we actually have the right culture. And I'll just say here that culture is not something you can change in one day. It's, it's a process, you know, but keep doing the right things and putting things in place for your organization. That I said, it's your recruitment process, you need to get it right from day one. The kind of people that you bring into your organization, their values, their backgrounds, are extremely important for us to be able to build a good culture. If you have the wrong culture in an organization, no matter what strategy, they put in place, it will not work at all. Okay, so Amanda. Amanda. So Amanda is raising up her hands. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so yeah. quick question yeah. um regarding the last statement you made about um not yeah. giving room for people gossiping. So basically, when somebody comes to say something to you. Um, deal with it immediately. So I wanted to find out at what point do you now need to 
implement emotional intelligence because I have been in a situation and I have seen cases where somebody came to, it was not gossip in quotes. It was more like reporting um, a subordinate who wasn't doing something right. And the team lead at the time thought it was best to confront it and call the person into the room and same case scenario. Oh, you, this person said you didn't do this and you didn't do that. Well, that was a good strategy in the eyes of the team lead. Back end for the subordinates, it created bad blood that at some point, one of them had to resign because it was intense. I wanted to just find out at what point do you now learn to balance the scale? Okay, fantastic question. Okay, so I'll tell you what I, I'll tell you what I would do. One thing, first things that I always say is that as a line manager, Maybe a line manager in finance, not, not necessarily, not in HR now. Let me use another department. As a line manager, not in HR, you need to be able to deal with your employee, your team's issue, you know, even in terms of performance. Is that before you escalate, even escalate it to human resources. That's why I said something about culture, it comes from the top. So, in terms of emotional intelligence, you have to be able to read, understand the person you're dealing with. Some people don't like that matter in public. They don't like it. That's why they say something you scold in private and then praise in public. So you have to be able to balance that. If this person, particular person is not doing very well, not achieving, what conversations have you had with them? You know, how can you also help and also support them? Not carrying their matter to HR to tell HR, oh, this particular person you know, is not doing very, very well, but you've not had, even had a discussion with that particular person. So it's extremely important. Emotional intelligence is key, but you also be able to understand that, maybe the emotional intelligence, they say, you have to be able to put yourself in that person's shoes. So that's how I will deal with it. I'll, I'll ensure, that I said, there has to be a relationship between that person and the subordinate. And that's what where we are, a lot of us are lacking on in that. Patrick. Victor Patrick, your hands are up. Go ahead. Hello, Victor. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, in fact, I like the particular, the parts that you talked about, um, object. Um and the HR need to come in. Um, yeah. this question is an experience based question. I I once worked in an organization where the toxic person in this case is the HR, and I, my understanding is that the HR is supposed to be the people's person, and um, she was she was not able to manage conflict each time we have conflict in the organization. So in this case, I know that in 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 an organization, hiring is key. The, the kind of skill set and the kind of person you engage in an organization is very key so that you can be able to manage the temperament of the person. But this HR, in this case, is the person that is creating um, the kind of rancor that we're having in an organization. So as a personnel that is trying to strive and trying to balance um situation, what are you expected to do when you have that kind of HR person? Thank you, and over. Okay. Thank you. That, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for that. When, when you have an it, 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 HR is toxic, that's a major problem. But if HR is also toxic, the, the onus is for the MD to notice that this HR is toxic. If they don't notice that, then that's then that, that's a major, major problem. That's why I said earlier, it's always good for the MD or CEO of any organization to have a bias for HR. You know, because once you want to do that, because that role, including for HR. If the MD himself or CEO wants to change that culture of toxicity, he needs to ensure, ensure that the person is bringing to run that department understands his vision and mission and the kind of culture he wants to create. If you have a toxic HR in the business and the, the um, senior, the leadership team can't see that or identify it, then there's a big problem in that. It's going to be very difficult for him to manage that because they'll just be causing conflict among people within the business. You can approach them and your attrition rate will now start to go up and they'll be wondering, why the attrition rate is going up. I would have said what it can also do is that I don't know whether your HR department does a survey. It should be an employee attitude survey that you do, employee attitude survey that you also conduct. If HR throws it out, then you can see all then management can then see that HR is actually the problem and then um, sort out the issues. But still Basil, your hands are up, Basil. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, huh? Yeah. All right. My question goes like this. Uh, does a line manager have the right to fire um, one of his team members? Then, 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 and, and, and the HR will go ahead and implement it. 
Or is HR not supposed to do an investigation first, at least to find out the reason why he should be fired? I don't know if you get my question, sir. I do, I do. So basically, okay. what normally happens, but okay, the way it, it is now, for, it's not the, you can't just fire someone like that even as a line manager. You cannot fire someone like this. If it's based on performance, there has to be evidence that the person has had performance over a period of time. And you must also have, and if, if it's based on stealing or anything, there has to be a disciplinary with HR, legal, internal audit, and chairman of the committee also has to be there. So, so that when you're firing person, the same fired person on poor performance, let's use that as, a, as an example. Where's the evidence of poor performance? What did you do to correct that poor performance as line manager? If you tried, if you, did, if you didn't do anything, there was the, was the, that's why I said HR needs to also investigate. HR should not just do, take it and then HR should question why are you firing? Okay, it's not performing. Where's the evidence? I have no evidence. So how can you say it's not performing? Okay, this is the evidence. Then, okay, what do you do to ensure that I started performing? Then outline, okay, you went to this development program, it did this, it did that. Okay. I've had a conversation with the employee himself and why he's not performing very well. So there's a process before you can fire somebody. So there has to be some conversation that going go on between the line manager and also the employee, with HR president there. So a, a line manager can just wake up one day and fire someone. And the HR to also dance with you. Think that's wrong. Yeah. Are they dire? Are they dire? Are they with Are they dire? I can't hear you. Hello? Yes. Yes, go okay. Uh, I have uh, two questions. The first okay. one is a situation whereby an organization keep bringing in so-called competent hands from the industry to the detriment of lawyer and dedicated staff within. And that one is now constituting a disincentive and the people who have either to been loyal to the organization are now looking outside for better opportunities. How do you reconcile this? Because some of the people that are actually hired from outside, they are not experienced as experienced, but because they were jumping around, jumping around through the industry, they are missing. That's number one question. The number two question, one of the telecommunication companies lately fired about 20 people from one of their units after implementing AI. Is this a sign of things to come? Or what is the challenge with the AI? Does it pose a threat in the industry? Thank you. OK. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that te technology is moving at a very fast pace. That's a lot. It's moving at a very fast pace right now. And a lot of processes are also being automated. Uh, the reason for that is to also drive efficiency and also effectiveness within any organization. You know, I always say that women, um, it's always best to also put yourself in the organizational shoes. An organization exists to make money. That's why the, the, the existence is to make money and also impact their society. That's why an organization exists. And most organizations also, find, also try to find a way of how can we also cut our costs. You know, and personal cost is also high. So if I can get an AI that can do certain things for me and automate something for me, why do I want to put a human being there? I'm just being very logical. So it is it, but there will, just, there will be some rules. That's why I'm saying that the jobs nowadays are evolving and changing. The traditional jobs are sort of eroding, and now there's some new jobs coming along, the technical jobs and all that. So that's where, in terms of building a skill set, that's where areas we start to focus on. There's been a dramatic shift and it's time to start to focus on those, uh, those new tech jobs that are coming up on, because that's, that's some jobs that technology will not be able to replace. Then in terms of your first question that you ask, in terms of um, loyal employees within an organization and um, bringing in new people to join the organization, there are, there are two things I'll, I'll address here. The, the, the loyal people in the organization, are they, are, are they competent? If they've been competent over years and they're delivering on the expectation of the organization, fine, then there's no point in taking them away. Then these people that are bringing in, are they more experienced than people that are fine inside? That's why the owners also on HR to say, okay, they're bringing in these people in. Look at their skill set, look at their qualification, look at what they've done before. These are the, the people that we have internally. 
what experience do our people have internally? You know, that like I said, you can look at loyalty, you can define it in two ways, you know. The people in, internally, are they delivering on what we want as an organization? The people internally, do they have the current skills that we require within the business? So it's not a yes or no answer. Everything boils down to the organization achieving its own goals. You know, I would say sometimes you can do a mix. I, I believe you can buy it from people. It's always good to also have a mix, bring in people, but also grow your people internally. The people you have internally that have been loyal, have you developed them enough to be able to deliver on, on the objective of the organization? Or you just left them static, you didn't do anything, and they themselves didn't do anything to themselves. They just thought, oh, I've been in the organization for 10, 11 years. My people have not developed me. I know this thing very, very well. I have a client like that. He's had people in his business for a long time. But in terms of value, they're not really having that value. But the thing that they also feel very entitled. So it's a two-way traffic, really. There's not, it's not a yes or no answer. It depends on where the organization is at that point in time and what kind of skill set that they require. So I'll take one last question up from Adolphus before I move on to my next slide. Adolphus, oh, Adolphus has gone. Shimilor is here. Question similar before I move on to my next slide. Shimilor, can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to the next slide. I can't hear him. Hands are up. So now, after we've looked at the organizational culture, next thing is how do we, how do we use technology to achieve our goals? First things first, technology has come to stay. Let's not debunk that. The way of work has changed. So technology is very, very important in everything that we do. So the extreme, so nowadays you don't put in your CV, oh, I know how to do Microsoft and all that is, is, is a given. PPT, PowerPoint is a given. All those things are a given, you know? So from the HR team, the first thing that you start for is your workflow plan, your analysis in terms of the workforce. What workforce, what workforce would you need in the fix, in the future for your business? And what, are, what are the trends within the market? Because every day, the trends keep changing. Market is changing. New businesses are coming up, you know? It's extremely important. I remember days in um, in HL then when we had um, at the, the towers that we had generators. We had all those things placed across different country, different uh, different states. We are buying generators. We are doing this, but over the years they realized that look, the role of HL and NTN is to is to sell voice, we sell air, you know. So let's focus on selling our air and our sources other things to people that are very good in it. For example, the generators can be managed by a company that will not be or we just be paying for, we don't be paying on usage of the diesel. In terms of the towers that we use, the company can be handling the towers, we're paying on usage. So that's why I said, as, as an HR person, what's your workforce plan about? What's your analysis? What's also your scenario plan? You know, in terms of strategies for your workforce. In these days of Jaguar, you also have to also plan for it. It's extremely important to still kill. We have 10 people, five people in the IT department now. And the, the age range within, in, if I use your, in, in your organization, you have people within 25 and 35. You know, you know that, okay, they, are, they have Japa plans. So these are things you also have to forecast in your plans. So, okay, this person leaves now, where will we get this other person from? So you have to start thinking of that. Then the, the experience you give your employees, you know, just based on the last question you asked in terms of AI, you know, what AI tools can you deploy within your environments to ensure that employees are getting the full support that they get and their experience is very good, either in terms of recruitment, in terms of onboarding, very, very important. What net wellness programs are you putting in place? Because your employees with you for eight hours in a day, so it has to be something to keep them going and to also help you as a business. If they're not well, they cannot do your work for you. The other key one is diversity and inclusion, extremely important. You know, there has to, there has to be there's diversity, there's inclusion, and there's also belonging. You have, you have a diverse population that is included, and they also need to also belong. You know, you can be included, but not belong. So it's extremely important for us to, to measure those metrics, use analytics to see that. For example, if you're recruiting in the finance department, for example, I know you, maybe there are five people in the finance department, and four of them are all males and just one female. So in your next recruitment, you just okay, let's add an additional female so that you can have a balanced gender. Balance. And the analytics that you can also use, you need to also measure this in terms of, there's one called textile, ideal and memory. This just helps you in terms of measuring also bias in terms of your workplace. And other guys also do some research on, on that, a, a lot of that. So extremely important to have a diversion and inclusion policy in your business. So that you have a mix. You will share, even the investors now, what they look at in your, in your, uh, in your organogram is your leadership team, especially people that you have on your board. If you see that's why if you notice on boards these days, 
it tends to see a lot more women, 50-50%, 50-50 or 60-40. Because that's what the investors are looking at, especially when they're doing your when they're looking at your books, it's very, very important in terms of diversity in your board, diversity in terms of your management team. That's what they'll be looking at. So it's extremely important for us to have that in place. Another thing we also need to also talk about is data analytics. You speak with data. Just don't tell them your MD that you want to recruit 500 people, 300 people. What's the benefit in terms of monetary terms? If I bring in 10 people, this is how much revenue we're going to grow in our business. And also, how do you measure productivity? Very, very important. That data analysis is key. And also, retention and turnover, attrition rates. You know, as I said, you have to be able to measure it. What was the attrition rate last year? What was the attrition rate this year? You know, with the Japan thing, attrition has been a lot. You know, so you have to also be able to plan for it. Which departments are, are people leading the most? Like uh, mostly the, tech, tech, the techie guys. That's why you notice in bank systems these days they go haywire because the techie guys are, are not are not there anymore. So as a nature process, these are things you need to be using data. You need to be using tech technology to measure for you to meet your organizational goals. You don't want a situation that someone resigns. You have to in your mind that your people are going to resign one day. They're going to leave you one day. You have to have it in your mind. It's like the technical guys, you know, and people within a certain age range, maybe from 28 to 35 to 40. These are people that are trying to jack my. You have to know that they're going to leave someday. So start planning for it, you know. And what can help you is your technology tools that will also do that. And also engagement. How engaged are your employees, you know? You can need to, as I said, surveys will help you do all that. You know, employees, employee engagement surveys will help you to know, okay, how engaged am I with this? I can also use tools for this to help you achieve that. Also, you can also use how to have a data driven culture in terms of learning. Extremely important. You know, there's a lot of e learning tools online right now that you can also plug into. So you need to also HR people, you need to also train yourself on technology. Extremely important. You know, a lot of things, a lot of HR um, applications are on apps now. So rather than you the person can go and leave and just use this app to go and leave. These are things we need to start to introduce within our organization. And also data literacy. How can people learn? There's Udemy, there is um, links, there's LinkedIn, there's Coursera. Build yourself up in that, you know, understanding all these technologies, understanding all these things, and trying to foster, foster a learning organization. What you can also do, maybe once a month. Have like a training where so someone you know can do a training for everybody. You know, you can do like have a training plan that you're doing that start the business that will train on their business. Finance will come and train us on certain things. You know, it's extremely important. It helps to grow that business. Then one key thing I also want to emphasize here is governance. HR is governance. There has to be accuracy, completeness, and reliability of your HR data. So that your HR data must be consistent, you know, extremely important. You know, just don't have the data of an employee reading something else, another thing reading another thing else. That's why whatever tools you are using or technology you are using is extremely important to have that quality and integrity of your data. Because it's that data that you use in making a lot of decisions. So let's and if you if you are if you are found in doubt that it's not working very well for you, try and learn how to ensure that your data is actually the very, very reliable. Previously is the watchword in HR, you know, always have a clean desk. When you are leading, and even when you're working on your system, ensure that you lock your system. Don't leave your handling period that people are seeing or what people are earning. It's extremely important to protect employee information. They can sue you for that. And also, in terms of your KPIs, metrics, how do you bet on business performance and all? It's very, very important for us to be able to know how to do that and how to achieve that. Sorry, I'm moving a bit fast because time has, is fast spent. Then finally, we need to monitor. How do we monitor? By constantly having review meetings, town hall meetings, all the time, and also getting feedback. Your organization has to just have an organization where you can get feedback from employees. That's only that's the only way it can be better. It will also recommend for HR, have an HR service, send it out to employees to find out okay, what are you doing right now? What are you not doing? What do you need to improve on? It's extremely nobody's indicting you. It's just a way of you improving yourself and also getting better for you to meet your organizational achievements. Because if you don't do that, what's going to happen? You're going to be falling behind. You won't be able to come to the right strategy to reach the organizational goals. It's very, very important to get those feedback will also help us a lot. In concluding, what I will say is that for you to have the right HR strategy aligned to your goals, you yourself, you also ensure that do I have the right skill set within my team? Do I have the right processes in place? And how can I use technology to help me achieve this? It's extremely important. And as the job said, is that great things are done by my one person, but, to be, but they are done by a team of smart people. You know, great things are not done by one person, they are done by a team of very smart people. 
So it's extremely important for us. For us, if we are aligning our HR strategy or building HR strategy, we have to first look inwards first. And then because that HR department is extremely crucial, it's extremely important because they are in between the management team and, and the employees, you know. And it's difficult for you in terms of management wants something done this way and you feel no, it has to be done that way. So how do you put that balance? You, know, you have to be able to manage all these emotions, manage your MD, manage your CEO, manage your, your, your chief executive, manage your leadership team and also manage employees. So there has to be strong emotional intelligence on your part of that HR person. That's why that skill and confidence that's of your HR is extremely important. So I can take questions now. We're going to just have time. And we still have less than 15 minutes for our questions. Okay. She's okay. Go ahead. So Shimler is back on. Okay. Shimler. Oh, okay. She's okay. Go ahead. She's okay. Yes, you can talk. She's okay. Okay, I'm guessing. Okay, I think we just have some similar, similar rate. I'll move to similar rate then. Similar, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. My hand has been up for a while now. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Yes, thank you so much, sir, for the um breakdown of information that you just conveyed. Thank you so much. Yes, my question as a HR professional. How long or how often can we change our jobs? Some say two years, some say three years, some say one and a half years. But how long do, do we have to stay in a particular position before we change that it won't affect our CV or our resume? Thank you. Well, that's, that's, that's a very interesting question. Okay, uh, let, let, me use my, let, let me use myself as an example. You know, and I always say there's no right or wrong answer. There's no particular way of doing things. So it depends on your end goal at the end of the day. If you check my profile, when I changed jobs, I didn't, I didn't change jobs, within, in, I changed industries technically. You know, what I always tell myself is that the first year, you need, when you join an organization, the first year you need to learn. Second year, you're building on what you have learned. Third year, you're consolidating. By the fourth year, you need to start um, looking at, especially if the organization is not offering you what you really desire as an HR person to grow, you know? So, because when I see some people 10 years in an organization doing the same thing, I just feel it's one year experience multiplied by nine or multiplied by 10. So it depends on what you do, your goals, what you want to achieve at the end of the day, you know, as an HR person. And um, it depends on where you currently are within your organization. If there's no growth path for you and if you're not, you're not learning, I would say one year, I would say three years. I, would, I can just say from three, three and a half years, you know, by that time, at least by three years, at least learn the ropes and learn the business of the organization. But if you're in an organization where you're being also rotated, you're not just doing one thing. For example, you're doing recruitment today, you're doing things like you're doing um, um, compensation and benefits tomorrow, you're doing HR business partnering, they're, they're rotating you like that, then you can just stay on. But everything depends on what you want to achieve at the end of the day. Yeah. Okay. Right, so I'm going to meet Mr. Ejiro. Okay. Ejiro, Mr. Ejiro. Hello, I can't hear him. Okay, I think yes, I'm so, mute now, so. Victor. Yes. Okay, so I have two questions. Um, the first, I, don't, I just want, this might not really be a question. I just want to know if the, um, we can get a system that evaluates HR activity in an organization. If you guys have any system that works that you can use to evaluate HR activity to see if they are meeting um, um, their deliverables or they are getting, for example, if I have an organization and I want to get an HR person, um, what are the whether there's a system in place that I can be looking out for to say okay this indicator shows that this HR is is good to go for my um, organization. Um, that's one, and then um secondly um it's just like a follow up to the previous question about um 
what shows in your CV. I remember that um, there's one time I, I was, there's an organization that was interviewing me and uh, they looked at my CV and they said, you're a runaway person. You know, one year, six months, one year, six months, one year, six months in your CV. Well, what's happening? Uh, we can't keep you. I'm not sure we can keep you because you are always running. Um, <laughs> for me, it's funny, but again, um, I also want to ask that if you are applying for a particular job and you have tons of experience on your CV, because some of our CVs are very, very voluminous, um, what can you do to make that CV smart enough and precise and straight to the point? Thank you and over. Okay, let me answer your second question first. Um, for, to make your CV smart, focus on more on achievements and what, you are, what you've achieved in the span of, of time. So you, your key focus will be on achievements. And because if you check those CVs I said that robots, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of activities that you've written in there, not, not, not achievements. So what I say, you achieve, I achieved this, I achieved that, I dropped cost by this percent, I grew business this by this percent. So focus more on achievement and that will bring your CV to a concise because it doesn't matter as an agricultural person, you know, you spend every like a minute looking at someone's CV, something has to tickle your fancy in terms of what this person has done before and why you want to bring this person into your business. So I, I would say focus on more on achievements and less on process, um, process in terms of I did this, I was responsible for this. I was, that doesn't tell me anything. If you are responsible for funds or something, it doesn't mean you actually did it or you did that. That's the way I look at it. In terms of systems and HR activities, I, I wasn't quite clear. But from what I hear is that you want to be able to measure how someone is performing, especially someone on an HR, the HR team. I think first things first, you have to understand, you have to first know what is the what is the goal? Or what, what is this person supposed to do? What, is the, what, what are the KPIs? What am I expecting from this person? And you can have a dashboard on that, you know? So and the biggest way to also monitor people, I always encourage managers, but have one-on-ones with your sub subordinates. 10, 15 minutes, you know, maybe a, a Mondays, one-on-ones, 15 minutes. How was, how, what did you last week? How did it go? What, what were the challenges? How can, how can we help you to, to thrive on this role? Those are questions you need to be asking, you need to be engaging, you know? You just don't wait from January to June and then start talking and, and then correcting. You know, if you can do this, also that will also help. In terms of systems, I think there are a whole lot of system, system but I, I can't think of any at the moment. Some ERPs have things that you can also use to monitor people's activities on them. Okay. Pedro. Um, Pedro Amretepa. Chijoke is back. Hello. Is it Chijoke? Hello. I can hear you, go ahead. Okay. My question is, okay, I have a question and a comment. First of all, I want to make reference to what you said about um, um, people from this person into your organization when you have experienced hands that are already there in your organization that could have taken over from these foods that are vacant. Now, I want to set a practical example. Let me use the Nigeria banking system as an example, because I've worked most of my years in the banking system, so I think I can talk from experience. There's one funny habit that banks in Nigeria like to do. I'm not going to mention this, but most banks are guilty of that. They have experienced hands in the system already under the so-called name of contract staff. Now, these are people that have been on the work for like four, five years, or every six years. They know the in and out of this work. Now, if there's a vacancy for maybe a, a, a wood that was led by a permanent staff or a core staff, maybe a managerial wood or head of a unit, as the case may be, rather than just upgrade the, the, the experience, in, in quote, casual staff into that wood and give him one or two extra units, they fail to bring somebody outside who doesn't know A to Z about the world, about the banking system, just because that guy does finish from, uh, what we call to finish from the bank training school, or just employed as an ET, as, as the case may be. Now, when that guy comes to the system, it is the experienced hand who they think is a conference that will end up training that guy, who is a core staff, as the case may be, training him on the job and teaching teach him everything he or she needs to know. So I believe this habit is very, this fact is very, very bad. Because rather than waste money and play so-called cost and pay them 
price as of now, as the case may be, why not just upgrade your price forecast or contract up to that level and do one or two training and they are good to go because they are really system into the no the inner art, they know everything better than usual about the banking sector. That is not as to see respect to what you said about bringing people from outside your usual into your usual when it comes to um, availability of rules. The second, the second question is this. If, for example, you are not, you have not been to HR per se, let's say you are more into customer care, because you want to start HR practice, for more stage can you begin? Like what level, what area of HR can you start? You want to go to HR practice fully? Thank you. Okay, let me, okay, let me, let me, let me, let me okay, I'll take the first, so I'll take the two questions. In terms of, um, this is just my, my opinion, in terms of contract staffing, and one thing I always tell, I always, I'm a, I'm a realist, you know, and um, I also want to add that life itself is not fair, you know, and everything. I mean, I quite agree with you that that's the logical thing to do in terms of a contract staff has been on this role and there's a vacancy, let's move that person into that role. That's the most sensible and logical thing to do. The onus is on the hiring manager for that department to push for that particular contract staff to go into that role. You know, when it comes to recruitment, there are a lot of dynamics that comes into play, you know, and humans being, being human beings, you you tell yourself, oh, this contract staff, I'm good at this now, just leave that person there and everything. Let's bring in someone, my friend or someone I know, or from one ED, and all that happens a lot, I'll not deny that. But the owners, I always keep to tell people that your um, your career is in your hands, but the owners in that, in that contract staff know that they're good, and not be waiting for that organization to employ them as permanent to employ them as permanent staff and then go ahead and then try and also look for jobs in other places. Because I I'm, like I said, I can I'm very realist. Nobody owes you anything. There can be a role available and you are the best person to do that particular role here, but they can give it to somebody and the person not as competent as you. HR can talk to the line manager, why don't you move this person? The, the owner is on the business to be able to do that. That's where HR also comes in. You know, if that line manager is not pushing for that contract staff, how would HR be able to do that? You know, that's number one. Sometimes HR can push it and say, okay, this guy is good, let's move it and then run it and ensure that person is brought on board. So that, that I said, there's a lot of dynamics, not, not a yes or no or maybe answer. A lot of politics also is also part of it that also enter or also be part of that, that situation. So it's a situation we just have to manage as an HR person. You know, it's difficult, but I can give you a simple example. This role is, is vacant. There's a contract side that can do that can do this work, and there's a customer that I have outside in the bank. That's okay. I'm going to bring like is it um, hundred million to your bank? Employ myself to do that. Let that contract staff, staff teach that person. So the bank look at it as this guy. If I employ this boy, his, his father is going to give us a hundred million as as um, as part of what what we require in the bank. So they'll do that. So there's a lot of dynamics that comes to play. Let's be real. You know, a lot of things come to play. That, that's why this is happening. Yeah. Yes, thank you, you very much. Yes. Yes, and also to add, uh, part of what I'm taking from this whole, from the whole conversation is upskilling and reskilling. Uh, we are in the area whereby AI is taking over. As an HR, we have to upskill ourselves. We have to learn how we can survive even when it comes in and and, on. and I hope every other person to also learn from that to upskill and reskill it is very important. And HR strategy is it has like you said, I was happy you mentioned the politics in that is involved because we all yes. have we all work in organization. Politics is like a it's like a key thing in HR itself. So it comes in. It might seem unfair at a point, but it is what it is. And um, the fact of uh, recruiting somebody for a new position where we have somebody who could have upskill. Um, also, as an HR strategy, too, if, it, if you ask me when it comes to maybe um, banking sector now, I would, if, if the strategy is to um, really strategize, bringing some people's um, knowledge or whatever they've learned. I would prefer to up to recruit somebody from another company because of what the person will be bringing into the organization. So sometimes it's not about um, bringing um, um, 
it's not about recruiting a, a new person just because the person has no experience, but it's because of the strategy that HR has sat down with the management that, okay, we want somebody with this experience. We want somebody to bring in a change into the organization. So um, I don't know if that's helpful for any other person. We have um, two more questions, but we might be taking one because our time is fast spent. So I don't know so if you made a very good yes, point sir. in terms of uh, you made a very good point in terms of politics, you know, and that's what HR tries to deal with. You know, there's always there's going to be politics in any organization. Let's not fool ourselves. So what HR tries to do is just to manage, understand it, manage it, and not taking any sides. You know, as an HR, that's where you need to understand the politics. Who are the key stakeholders? How do you manage them and ensure that things are working with you? So politics is, is is embedded in any organization, and it's extremely important for us to do that. Yeah, Jude, go ahead. I said I'm just highlight that. Jude. Um, after Jude, we'll be um done with our questions. So um Jude will be the last person. I mean, Jude if you have any question, you could just drop it on the okay. I think Jude has had a question before. Um Tosin. Let's take to yes. Tosin, you okay. can unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Good evening, sir. Thank you for the insight Good evening. For session. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is this, why is it that some HR would rather want you to drop a resignation letter before you will be asked if you want a raise or before they give you what they think you deserve? Um, so this was the situation that happened to a friend and it had to get to the point where, okay, the person has been trying to convert from a contract staff to a full-time staff for a long time. And when they did review with the teams that I was working with, I was working with two major teams. One of them said, oh, he wasn't delivering. Maybe because of the feedback she got anyway. Then the other team were like, okay, we can take him on board. But it got to a point that he got frustrated, having been on the contract, not being staffed in for months, and he decided to drop his res resignation letter. Immediately he dropped that letter. Everyone started running everywhere. What do you need? How much should we pay? And I asked the question, why does it have to get to that point? And I got one shocking feedback that says, oh, that is how it works here. So yes, I've read a lot on Twitter and people will say, if your organization is offering you more money at the point when you're leaving, don't take it. But surprisingly, in some organizations, that is how they operate. Uh, if it was to wait for the company to make him a staff, they wouldn't have paid him up to the amount he was asking as of when he wanted to leave. So I just want to understand how do you, I mean, how do you then progress in that kind of organization? I mean, you just have to sleep and wake up one day and say, okay, today I need to threaten them with resignation so that they can increase my salary maybe by a 200,000. And if you're not doing that, they will keep telling you, oh, you're doing a good job, but sorry, we cannot give you a raise now. Oh, you're doing a good job, but sorry, we cannot give you a raise now. Highest that gets his appraisal bonus. So I just want to understand the dynamics. I mean, how do you differentiate a raise that comes because, yes, they know you deserve it and they're giving you because you deserve it. And then how do you differentiate it from the one that they will give you and they'll frustrate the hell out of you to leave that organization? So I just want to understand the dynamics that, that works okay. in that situation. Yeah. I, I, I said, it's not everybody that calls themselves um, HR people that, that understand the concept of human resources. You know, for me, such, such, such organizations are just toxic. And um, if you can't check the culture there, it's bad. You know, because one thing I believe is you're giving a raise to, an, to someone and you're giving a raise to everybody. And if a person is resigned, and I always tell anybody that if you drop your resignation and the company says, oh, wait, don't worry, we'll not increase it, that's a setup for you because you've already pulled the trigger. So you better use it. You know, that's why I don't know who has what this movie, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know. When you point a gun at someone, make sure you use it. So you've resigned and they say, okay, no, don't resign, we'll give you this. That's still going to deal with you along the line. So I think there are a lot of bad HR practices out there. A lot, you know, a lot, in a lot of companies, a lot of bad HR practices. So what Star said, the onus is on the head of HR to stop this kind of practice. And that's why you used to have an HR where, HR team where someone wants to resign, they come and meet you. You have a sense of a while, so look, things are not working out here for me. I've gotten another offer, you know, and everything. Have that conversation with that person, you know. So HR needs to be open with your people, you know, and let them, and let people be also be able to trust you. I tell people, for you to know you're a good HR person, and employees should be able to come to you to say, I've gotten an offer, am I believing? What do you think? 
So it's actually to now advise the person to say, no, I think you should stay, this is work and all that. That's why I said employee engagement, the retention, all those practices, all those processes needs to be in place. You know, but if you have an organization once when you resign, they now say they're going to increase your salary. I think that is it's, 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 it's just bad HR practices. And there's a lot of, of that going on now, you know. And HR is always in bed with the leadership team. You, you, have, you have to be able to be objective as an HR person and see what benefits the organization. Come with your data. You know, if someone is doing very, very well, and you lose that line manager, sort of, I've had situations like that, a line manager is stifling that person. The onus is only HR to be able to look, let your team know that, okay, this person is actually good. The line manager is the one stifling this person. That's what HR is meant to do. You're supposed to protect your employees. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. It's been a oh, wonderful yeah. session. Um, our time is a fast spent, so um, I don't know if Doctor has a few words of encouragement to us. Okay, so what I'll say is, um, for me, um, human resources um, is quite interesting. Everybody wants to go into it, but also you have to know what you're going into. A lot of people just see HR. Okay, I want to do HR. I want to do HR, but it's gone beyond. I want to do HR. There has to be the value you are adding. In terms of you understanding what your business is all about, you know, understand how you can use pe people. Your, your your role as an HR person is to use people to be able to deliver on the expectation of the organization. And in terms and behavioral is extremely important. You need to be approachable as an HR person. Everything not that with policy says this. Policy says that mm -mm -mm. you have to be able to show some form of empathy and also be able to have a lot of emotional intelligence. Hear your hear, hear your employee out and also say, okay, what are these? What are the issues? How can we support you? How can we help you? Then for the leadership team also, when you're dealing with them also, ensure you have your facts and you have your data. You know, don't talk out of the air to say, oh, this person is performing, this person is doing this. Have your facts, have your data on the ground. It's very important. So they know that, okay, yes, this person is a professional. He knows what I'm talking about. And also understand the business, like the salesperson, as a nature person, to understand what the business is all about. So you can then advise. The, I'll give you just a simple a simple example, during COVID, uh, when we had COVID, we are working from home. Um, in terms of all production, it, had, it, it was very minimal. And also the, the amount, the, um, the sale of all I dropped like $20 a barrel. So the organization are now saying, okay, uh, should we let people go? That was the first option. The second option is increase people's salary and then cut it. Or the third option was to leave status quo as it is. So what I did as the HR, as the head of HR then was to come up with, with data and look, to say, look, previous years where we had a, down, a, a drop in all production, it actually went up after a few months and after, after a few months, it went up. Then the challenge now is that if we let people go, employing these people again at a, at a high crude oil price, it's going to be very expensive for the business. So the best thing we need to do is, let's not do any increase in salary now. This is not the point, and start costing people's salary. Let's just maintain status quo of how things are now, and then wait it out for the next couple of months to see how things go. I had my facts, I had my data, you know. That's protecting the employee and also advising management what they need to. That's why if I do not understand the business, and I say, ah, since the price of oil has dropped to twenty dollars a barrel, let's let people know who can can afford it to pay payroll. And no, no, that's not that's not it. That's why also the HR person and the finance person must also be good friends, somewhat be able to say, okay. Fine, this is the salary we want to pay. We also have to have, to have savings for the rainy day. That's what finance people do. Ensure we have that, that backup so when things happen, we can still pay salaries for a period and not spend everything. So as an HR person, what I'm just leave it here with you is understand what you're, you see yourself as the business person in that organization. Not necessarily HR, but a business person that's helping the using the people to get the business to where they want to get to. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. For that. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Mr. Adeleke Edo to speak on the Room Business School program. Uh, Mr. Adeleke, are you on the line? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's been a wonderful time afternoon, in this Mr. section. A uh, sincere appreciation to um, the keynote speaker, Dr. Onduka, and then our moderator, uh, Bukola. It's been a wonderful time. Thank you for managing the time and, and also the section. Um, so 
also to our audience, our sincere appreciation to you for joining to this section. In a very special way, I would like to identify Tunde Omoya. He's always here with his headphone and the camera on, showing full participation at the sessions. Okay, um, so I'm here. My name is Idowa Adeleke. I'm one of the line managers in the admissions department of Rome Business School. Um, we collectively, my team, um, assists admissions uh, process, assist with the admission process for the prospect. So if I prospect on this call, um, this session is just to give you a bit of what the expectation will be in the class, okay? Um, you can see that it's very interactive, it's very informative, and it's very insightful. So you're going to be having a whole lot more on this in your different classes also. Um, for the already enrolled students, this is part of the series of events for the Business Leadership Development Program. Okay, so um, you need an 80% attendance on this to qualify for the certificates, the complementary certificates that comes with it. Okay, so it's been a wonderful time. For the prospects on this call, reach out to your admission advisor, reach out to him or her to continue with the admission process, come on board, benefit from the offer that the school is offering at this time, and then get enrolled. Thank you so much for your time. Do enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah, thank you very much. Enjoy yourself. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Mr. Idowu. Thank you so much, Bukola and Dr. Unjuka Okoi. So thank you so much for honoring our invitation today. And also another shout out to Mr. Tunde Omoya. He's always um, here with us during all our workshops. He's always um, putting on his camera in a professional way. Thank you so much. And to every other person on this call, I would like to appreciate us all for joining and participating actively on the call. And I believe it was really an insightful section. So um, our speaker, Dr. Unduka, is on LinkedIn as Dr. Unduka Okoiso. So you can do well to reach out to him, connect with him for some of us that, have, that still have questions to ask. You can still connect with him and ask him questions. He's, he's very active on LinkedIn and he's going to answer your questions. Say where, say Batua, you can ask your question to Dr. Onjuka on LinkedIn. He will do well to answer you. Also, Bukola Olori is also on LinkedIn as Bukola Olori. He's one of our students and soon to be alumni um, in human resource management. So you can also do well to connect with him, with her as well. Idowu Adeleke is also on LinkedIn. You can do well to connect with him as well. Um, for some of us here that are requesting for the slides, please do well to fill the survey that we shared earlier. It's still on the chat box. You can do well to fill the survey. You get the slides and the recording of this um, program today. And thank you so much for joining. Also, a reminder to us that our career fair will be coming up on the 6th of July. So if you've not registered yet, you can do well to register. We'll share the communication across the different group chats or the different WhatsApp platforms. Please do well to register and make sure to um, come around on that day to participate. The venue will be at Providence Hotel here in GRA. So I would also like to thank our back-end managers, the ICT people, um, Francis, Mr. Sam Afariobon for, <laughs> for back-ending this um, program today. Thank you so much for always helping out in arranging this event. And on behalf of the Dean, Professor Ragusa, and every other staff in Home Business School, on behalf of the Director of um, Career Service, Ms. Sarah, um, Justina, Victor, we thank you for joining us today and 
Uh, we wish you a very nice uh, weekend ahead. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.